I might call some names today, and let me say maybe the story was changed to protect the innocent. But anyway, um, God is good, and all the time. The Kamasha, why are you looking nervous? <laughs> you know, I actually had to call him the other day to ask him if his first name was Albert because I call him Deacon Marshall so much. It's like his first name is Deacon. <laughs> Listen to him who always running jokes, he bad. Anyway, let's begin. There's an old, old story. People tell it different ways, but here's the way I tell it. There's an old, old story of a king who had a beautiful kingdom. It wasn't a very big kingdom. But it was a beautiful kingdom. And what made it beautiful was the landscape around the city. Beautiful landscape. And and the the people in the the city began to move out to the countryside and set up farms. And, uh, you know, cows and chickens and goats and sheep and, and planting all kinds of stuff. And as the farms began to grow, the city began to grow. And the people prided themselves by bringing the best of the produce into town to sell. People would come from far just to buy these high quality items. The best meat, the best corn and so on. But as the city began to grow and more and more farms began to establish, they begin to get close to the borders of their territory. And the wolves that lived in the nearby territories began to notice that more and more chickens and cows and goats are over yonder. So a small batch of wolves went venturing and they discovered that this was the promised land for wolves. And the wolves grew until they were a huge pack of vicious wolves and they began to shred and rip apart farms and and chickens and cows everywhere as they felt like and the the farmers would begin to come into town and complain to the king to do something about it and the king continued to ignore them until the wolves descended on the king's personal farm now the king's upset he gonna do something about it so he made a declaration I will pay one gold coin For every head of a wolf you bring to the palace. As soon as they heard that, all the hunters in town went out hunting. But they all came back running scared because there were so many wolves. And they were so vicious, they sent those hunters running for their lives. Word got out that none of the hunters were able to catch any of the wolves. And then young Albert Marshall figured, aha! This is my chance to get rich and finally be able to date that beautiful girl who, whose father won't let me talk to her because I'm broke. So he goes to his friends and he stirs them up and says, don't worry about this. The reason why those hunters couldn't catch them, they were old and they were slow and their hands were shaking. They couldn't aim the rifle good. We are young. We are strong. We can do it. So he got his batch of his friends and they went out deep into the woods. But all day they found no wolves. So as the sun was going down, they set up a huge tent and they all went in the tent to sleep. About one o'clock in the morning, one of young Albert Marshall's friends went outside to take a leak. And he looked and he saw 40, 50 more wolves than he could count surrounding the tent, getting ready to attack. So he rushes back in and wakes everybody up and tells them what's going on. And all of Deacon Marshall's friends, oh, we're going to die. Why did we listen to that idiot? He's going to get us killed. And in the commotion, Deacon Marshall, fine, sorry, Albert Marshall, young Albert Marshall, not Deacon Marshall, young Albert Marshall finally wakes up because he's a deep sleeper. And he says, what's going on? And when they tell him what's going on, a big smile comes on his face. Aha, we have found them. We're going to be rich. When you look at your life, When you look forward to 2024, whose eyes are you looking through? You see, some of us had an amazing year. Some of us had a year full of hope and all kind of dreams being fulfilled. Some of us had a very productive year, but some of us, when they look back at 2023, it feels to them the same way Albert Marshall's friends in the woods felt, full of fear full of hopelessness. And when they look at the evidence around them, 
All they can do when they look forward to 2024 is see hopelessness and darkness and devastation. But funny enough, in the midst of all of that hard evidence of hopelessness, devastation, and pain, one person didn't see it that way. One person saw opportunity. One person saw riches. One person saw a reason to be happy. So I ask you again, based on all that happened to you in 2023, when you look forward to 2024, whose eyes are you looking through? For you see, when you and I look at the evidence around us and we draw the conclusion that it's nothing but hopelessness, nothing but failure, I got news for you. God looks at that same situation and says he's nothing but opportunity and abundant life. So I want to know, when you look forward to 2024, whose eyes are you looking through? Is it possible that some of us need to change our glasses? Let's talk about it. Turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Some of you know, the minute here, Ezekiel chapter 7, 37, you already can hear that song in your head. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry. You remember it from your kindergarten? If you, you remember it, sing it to me. Them bones, them bones, them Dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to, we'll get as far as we can. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You should have no trouble following along. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 reads, The hand of the Lord came upon me. This is the Lord doing his work through the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Now, when I look at this text, I can't help but imagine. Have you ever seen a situation where a father will just find his kid wherever he is, no matter what the kid is doing, pick up the child, and for no reason, or no obvious reason that you can think of, just pick up the child and put the child on where the father wants the child to be. Have you ever seen that? Well, when I look at this text, I can't help but imagine it because God is Father God. And Father God, whenever he wants, can pick up his children and move them wherever he wants to move them. And sometimes he don't tell you why. He just do it. But I got to use when Father God moves somebody, he moves them for good reason. He moves them either for our benefit, he moves them for other people's benefit, or he moves them for his glory. But I want you to know that Father God can move people. Now, why do I bother to tell you this? Well, there's a member of our church, her name's Vicki. Now, most people expect contractors to be men. Most of the people who fix your bathroom, who fix your roof, who patch a hole in the wall, who install a new door. The people who do that, 99.9% .9 of that I have seen are men. You don't look at a woman and think she's a contractor. If you hear she's a contractor, you may ask for her husband or is she the secretary, but that is not what you think. But if you ever see Vicky in action, you're going to realize that, that there's some women who are better at it than the men. So, now that I, you see, you know, when I look at Vicky, she looks like one of those gourmet chefs that cook the expensive kind of meals that only rich people can afford. That's what she looks like to me. She looks like a professional gourmet chef. But uh-uh, she, her portable toolkit is so advanced, it makes my entire tool collection look like a joke. And she knows how to use all of them. So now that I know that Vicky can do this, what do you think? Who do you think I'm calling any time I need construction work? There's something about knowing something that empowers you to know who to call on when you need something. Why did I tell you all of this about God? I wanted you to know that your God can move people. Your God can move people by promoting them. Your God can move people by transferring them. Your God can move people by blocking them so they got to go down a different path. And when God does it, God does it for our benefit 
for other people's benefit or for his glory. And now that you know that your God can move people. I hope you will use this information to upgrade your prayer life. Because you may need, based on what happened in 2023, you may need a promotion. Talk to God about it. You may need a transfer to some other location or some other department so you can get peace of mind. Talk to God about it. You might need God to block something in your life. Don't just sit there thinking you can't do nothing about it. Talk to the God through whom all things are possible. Amen? I know that was a little sidetrack, but you, needed to, you need to know that your God can move things. He don't just move mountains. He can move people who you can't move. He can put you in the right place at the right time for the right reason. And he may not tell you why. Because he wants you to discover what he's going to do for you. Amen? But getting back to the text. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1 and 2 reads, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. Look at verse 2. He, God caused him to pass by them all around. And behold, there were many. You see, it wasn't enough for, for, for Ezekiel to just take a quick look. If, you, if the valley's full of bones, you can take a quick look. Oh, you had plenty of bones there. No, no, that wasn't good enough. God wanted Ezekiel to take a close look. He wanted him to examine it without question. He wanted him to go back and forth, up and down, so that Ezekiel would have a full understanding of just how hopeless the situation was. He wanted Ezekiel to understand there's not even flesh left on some of the bones. I don't want you to stand up here and say, well, the bones on top are dry. Because you get some of these modern scientists that can say, even if the flesh is rotting, if I can get just a little bit of the flesh, I can break down the DNA and I can probably tell you who it is. You understand? God wanted him to take a careful look so he would have a full understanding just how desperate the situation is. Whatever is, is let me back up a little. This was written in the biblical days. In the biblical days, when you come across, come across a valley full of bones like this, chances are, you're looking at a defeated army. You're looking at a defeated army. And the reason why the bones were left there is because the victor, the one who won the war, made sure that nobody touched those bones. He wanted them to stay there and rot as a further insult to the nation that they defeated. To remind them how thorough their defeat was. So we have a valley full of dry bones. When the war began, those soldiers had a lot of potential. When the war began, those soldiers had a lot of things going on. When the war began, those soldiers probably had dreams about their family. When the war began, those soldiers probably figured, you know, if, I, if we win the war, imagine the war prize and the war booty and the gold I'm going to take home to my family. Whatever they had going on before the war, their rank, their status, their paycheck, what, all their plans, Whatever they had going on before the war, now it's all gone. It's dead. It's hopeless. It's dry. And God wanted Ezekiel to understand the hopelessness of this situation. When you look back over 2023, I wonder, is anybody in here, when you look back over 2023, you had a job situation that now looks like a dry bones problem. You had a relationship situation that started out great, but now looks like a dry bones problem in your life. Did you have a, a, a problem where your finances were great at the beginning of the year, but now you got a dry bones problem? Maybe it's an opportunity that dried up. Maybe it's your health. I don't know, but I don't know. Is it possible that however you started out 2023, that now it's looked like nothing but 
dry bones. And just as how Ezekiel was made to look at this from every angle, I wouldn't be surprised that that situation that's bothering you, you have examined it left, right, up and down. And as far as you can tell, there ain't no more flesh left on it. There ain't no more blood left on it. And whatever is left, the bones are drying out. The only thing left is the evidence of what used to be. And the evidence gives you one conclusion. Hopeless. I might as well face reality and give up. I really hope that's not how your 2023 was. But if it was, chances are you're dealing with one or more dry bones type of problems. And in the midst of all of this desperate hopelessness, God has the nerve. I mean, God is a God of love. The Bible gives you so much examples of his grace and his mercy and his kindness and his gentleness and his understanding. If God is all of this, why would God now ask Ezekiel an impossible question? Anybody ever come and ask you an impossible question? Like they want you to pay a bill that you can't even put gas in your car and you want me to pay that bill. That's an impossible question. Well, what's worse? It's not your friend asking Ezekiel. It's not his brother he can brush off. It is God. Your boss ever come and ask you an impossible question? And you know what the boss can and cannot do? What about God? How are you going to tell God no? God comes and asks Ezekiel an impossible question. Here's a question. In verse 3 of Ezekiel chapter 37, God says, And God said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? What kind of question is that for God to ask Ezekiel? That is clearly outside of the ability of Ezekiel. But you know, there's some people, you're too scared to tell them no. You're too scared to give them a negative answer. We, don't know, we no longer live in the era of kings. But when kings rule most of the nations of the earth, one thing people know, if you go in there and give that king bad news, you might not come out alive. Where do you think this idea about don't kill the messenger came from? Because it was known back then. You send a message to the king that's bad king will punish the messenger and then come looking for you. How do you tell God no? God asked Ezekiel an impossible question. Can these dry bones live? He said the only kind of people who ask a question like this are the people who have some amount of hope. They ask questions like this. The other kind of people who ask questions like this are the people who can't do something about it. Those are the kind of people who ask questions like this. But you and I know when you've concluded your situation is hopeless, you don't want nobody asking you questions like this. All that's going to do is, can you say piss you off in church? Can you say that, deacon? There's some questions you, when you're in a certain mood and you've already con concluded it's hopeless and it's dragging your heart to the floor, some questions you don't want nobody to ask you. Leave me alone. But God asked Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And here's what Ezekiel says to God. So I answered, oh Lord, you know. Now you say, as a preacher, I want to tell you. This is what I want to say. I'm not going to say it, but I, this, I'm just telling you what I want to say. I, although by saying it, I'm saying it. But anyway, what I'd like to say is, no matter how bad your situation is, no matter how desperate your situation is, no matter how hopeless, even if your situation only has 1% of hope left, hope left, I want to tell you, even if it's just 1% of hope, still keep asking God for a miracle. But the truth is, I've lived long enough to know that when your hope drops to like 50% or 40%, or for those people who got really strong minds, when your hope drops to like 20%, you, all kind of things come into play. You, you ain't praying no more. When your hope drops to a level that you can't handle it no more, some new things come into play. Discouragement. 
depression, sorrow, anger, irritation, and a whole lot of hard questions that you don't want nobody asking and you don't want to answer. And you certainly don't want to hear the answer because you're just not in the mood. Oh, I already know the answer to those questions, but I'm already so depressed and discouraged. I don't need to hear those questions or the answers because all you're going to do is make me feel worse. So leave me alone. Leave me alone. So I'm not going to tell you what I should tell you, that even if it's only 1% hope, still ask God for a miracle. I'm going to tell you to do what Ezekiel did. Ezekiel, turn it back to God. That's what you and I need to do. Turn it back to God. Now, it's easy to say that, but how do you do it? There's so much here to preach. I won't be able to get to that question today, but there's plenty of other good stuff here. There's just too much here to preach. You know, people like to tell you, let go and let God. You know, they never tell you how to do it. But looking at Ezekiel, we want to learn something from Ezekiel today. God asked Ezekiel an impossible question. And Ezekiel had enough sense to realize, I ain't telling God nothing negative. So the smartest thing I can do is give the question back to God. And that's exactly what you and I need to do. We don't know what to do. When the hope is gone, when the situation is desperate, when the bones are drying out or have been dried, and all you see is evidence of nothing but hopelessness, turn it back to God. Now, here's what happened next. Verses 3 to 6 reads, And God said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So Ezekiel answered, O Lord God, you know. And again, the Lord said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, that is like the, the tendons connecting the muscles to the bones, and you will bring, f- and I will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This is what the Lord is telling Ezekiel to say to the bones. Ezekiel hasn't done nothing yet. But let's be honest. What God is telling Ezekiel to do is crazy. That don't make no sense. In all of Ezekiel's wisdom, he knows ain't no man alive can do that. In all of Ezekiel's experience, ain't nobody can do that. So God, why are you asking me to do something crazy? That don't make no sense to me. I want to know if God asks you to do something crazy that don't make no sense to you, would you do it? Let me show you this from two perspectives. First, I'm going to show you from a perspective similar to this. Let's say this was a funeral right here. And the body is right here. The body is confirmed dead by the police report, confirmed dead at the hospital. He's been in the morgue for who knows how long. They've already prepared the body and pumped all the whatever is in there so the body will rot slowly. It's been in a freezer for days and now it's here in a coffin closed so there's no air. That person is as dead as dead can get. What if the pastor or God told you, pick up the microphone at the funeral and declare that body to come to life? Would you do it? You're going to be thinking, I ain't going to look like no fool. I ain't going to do that. I gonna use, you think I'm stupid, God. I ain't doing that. Worse, let's say you're now at the gravesite. You buried your relative. Now you're at a graveyard just like this, full of dead bones. What if God or the preacher tells you to shout out loud and declare all the bones in the graveyard to come to life? You going to do it? You going to tell Pastor Jay, you think I'm an idiot. If God tells you to do that, I don't know what you're going to tell him, but you're probably going to tell him no. Why? Because you don't want to look like a fool. If God would give you absolute proof it would work, then of course you're going to do it. You'd call CNN and every television company before you did it. But if you don't know, you ain't going to tell God no. So I ask you again, if God asks you to do something that to you don't make no sense, are you going to tell him no? 
Let me flip it around. Let me put it on me. Let's say I'm preaching this sermon. And while I'm preaching this sermon, the Lord tells me in my spirit, I'm to go over to Avion and to declare on the microphone in front of everybody, Avion, you are free from cancer in the name of Jesus. What if God told me to do that? And I'm like, in my spirit, no, Lord, I've never done that before, you know. I've never healed anybody before. Lord, you gave me the gift of preaching, not the gift of healing. What if I go and do that and I get embarrassed because nothing happened? No, Lord, I don't want to be a fool. No, no, I'm not going to do it. Mm -mm, no, Lord, you have to, maybe when I go home, if the parrot is dead, you can tell me to bring the parrot back to life and slowly, little by little, build up my confidence. And when I'm in a hospital room and nobody's around and the patient is unconscious, I can lay hands on them. And when I get used to it, yes, Lord, but not like this, Lord. No, no, I'm not doing it. I don't want to be embarrassed. It sounds weird when a preacher says it, doesn't it? You'd be amazed. The range of excuses and the range of ways we tell God no when he tells us to do something that don't make any sense to us. And that's one thing if you're not sure if it was God. But many times, the reason why you're coming up with those excuses is because you know good and well it was God who spoke to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be coming up with those excuses. You just brush it off as nonsense. Now, what if God did tell me to go and lay hands on Avian? Avian doesn't have cancer. You don't have cancer, do you? Okay. Avian, no, she doesn't. Oh, okay, her hand is busted up. I don't know who she punched, but it wasn't me. See, my teeth are all there. So let, let's say God told me to go and lay hands on her and heal her of cancer, and I said no. Who's going to lose out? Avian's going to lose out because now... Unless God calls somebody else to heal her, she's going to have to deal with all the pain, misery, and additional expense that God was planning to set her free from. I'm going to lose out because I'll probably lose out on the opportunity to get the gift of healing and get trained how to apply it in public the first go. Not only that, all the other people who God would have used me to heal would lose out simply because I said no. Do you see how expensive telling God no is? I'm not talking about when you're not sure it's God. I'm talking about when you know it's God. And if you've ever given God an excuse, it's because you knew it was God and you didn't want to do it. Or you thought it would make you look stupid. Or you thought it would cost you too much money. And the list goes on. But God told Ezekiel to do something that most of us would tell God, no, call somebody else. And here's what happened. In verse 7 and 8, it says, this is Ezekiel speaking, so I prophesied as I was commanded. He didn't modify. He didn't delay. He didn't give God any excuses. He didn't change what God said. He did exactly what God said immediately without delay. Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling. This is where we should drum was here. Go brrr, and a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Ezekiel responded to God with immediate, uncompromised obedience. He did exactly what God told him to do. Nothing extra and nothing less. He didn't even add a phrase like, you know, I, I, I don't have the gift of raising people from the dead, but God told me to do it. So in case it don't work, you need to blame God. Raise, he didn't even do that to create an excuse to save him from embarrassment just in case it didn't work. He didn't do that. And Ezekiel witnessed the impossible. I know most people only love it when other people have to obey them. But when it's your turn to obey, 
We always find a way to do it halfway because we don't really like to obey. But here in this one example, Ezekiel is demonstrating to us the potential power of obedience. We want the results. We just don't want to pay the price. Obedience is expensive. Whether emotionally, financially, time-wise, and the list goes on, obedience is expensive. But the potential power of obedience will blow your mind. The average person would prefer if they had enough money, they didn't have to work. But you know why most of us work? Because we like to eat. Most of us work because we like to sleep indoors. Most of us work because we like to have, be able to buy things. So we continue to do what we'd rather not do in order to get what we really want. Why don't we apply the same principle to obedience? Obedience has amazing potential. We want the benefits, but we don't want to do the obedience. Could that be why 2023 wasn't quite the way you wanted it to be. But just look at the gym. All of us want to lose weight, but only a few are willing to go to the gym every single day. If you want the results, you have to do the work. But that's not all God told Ezekiel to do. In verse 9, God now gives Ezekiel more instructions. Verse 9. Also, the Lord said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. There's so much going on here. I need to break it down, and you cannot miss this. Watch this. The first time Ezekiel obeyed God's crazy, impossible command, crazy, impossible things happened. What if he had said no? Imagine the cost if he had said no. And having obeyed the first time, Ezekiel was now positioned in a unique place. God now knew he could trust him with even more. You ever notice if you want an A at school, you have to work for it? If you want a scholarship, you have to consistently get A's, 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 so you can get the scholarship. If you want to be in a position of intimacy with God where you are regularly seeing amazing things happen, you need to live the kind of life where God can take you from trust level to trust level. Look here. Zach, Ezekiel obeyed God the first time. And God allowed him to do something amazing. Then God said, oh, I can trust you. Now he asked him to do something even harder, even more crazy. God took Ezekiel from level to level. Because you obeyed him completely without compromising immediately the first time. Now he moved him to the next level. But let me show you how amazing it is. Because it is so easy to overlook this. Watch this. When Ezekiel obeyed God the first time. Dry bones with no flesh and no blood. Went from dry bones with no flesh and no blood to wet bones with flesh and blood. But they had no life. They were still dead bodies. The second time he obeyed God. These dead bodies came back to life. The breath of life was breathed into them. Let me show you how mind-blowing this is. By comparing this incident to the very first time this happened in human history. Keep your finger on Ezekiel chapter 37 and turn with me all the way to Genesis 
chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Because of Ezekiel's continuing increasing obedience, God allowed Ezekiel to do in numbers the size of an army. Let's say 100,000 men were in the army. God allowed Ezekiel to do 100 times over what God did once at creation. Do you see what I'm saying here? Ezekiel, because of his continuing... Remember, Ezekiel is a prophet. He's a prophet of God. He's preaching to a nation that didn't want to listen. Which means he was struggling to do the right thing all the time. He was living a life of obedience because nobody wanted to listen, but he kept on preaching. He is in the habit of obeying God. And he reached a point in his relationship with God and his habitual obedience to God. Because God figured, I can trust this man with a crazy command. And not only once I realized I could trust him with a crazy command, let me trust him with another crazy command that would blow his mind. And God allowed a man to do on a massive scale what God alone could do. The last time God did it, the first time God did it, he did it with only one man. And he allowed a man to do the same creation miracle on the scale of an army? Do you have any idea the potential power of obedience? Because of the obedience of this one man, a dead, dry, hopeless situation for an entire army was turned into a situation full of life and opportunities. Now every one of those soldiers can go and have a family again. Every one of those soldiers can have dreams again. Every one of those soldiers can build a house again. Every one of those soldiers have a second chance. Every one of those soldiers can have children and grandchildren. Every one of those soldiers, because of the obedience of one man, a dead, dry, hopeless situation, which was not on the scale of one person, but on the scale of the size of an army, was completely transformed. Do you have any idea the potential power of obedience. Absolute, complete, immediate, uncompromised obedience. Now you might say, well, unless I'm Ezekiel, God not going to do a miracle that size with me. Think about it. Because of Ezekiel's obedience, the long-term benefit in the lives of all of those men cannot be calculated. It's possible they're descendants today from those men. Let me show it to you in a flip way. There are preachers who have done some things that they shouldn't do years ago, and they managed to cover it up. Years later, when they're now a big, big preacher, it comes out, and it does devastating damage. You see the danger of disobedience. But what about when somebody makes, does something the right way, in the right place at the right time? When you investigate it years later and you find out that this person did the right thing in the right place at the right time, do you see what can happen? Nelson Mandela, years in jail, yet he was promoted to prime minister of the nation because he did the right thing back then. When a man and a wife chooses never to cheat on each other, look at the long-term benefits to their family. Grandkids can come over, great grandkids come over, and they can see the family legacy, the family standards unfolding before them because grandpa and grandma chose not to cheat on each other and break up the family. And now there's a continuation of the blessing of the obedience to God early in their life. Your obedience may seem small now, but the benefits long term are amazing. And from this text, we see that God rewards obedience. The 
question is, are we willing to live the kind of life where we go from one level of obedience to another level of obedience to another level of obedience, complete, absolute obedience, so that God can trust us with more and more and more. The more we obey, we don't like to obey. I, I'm honest with you, know, obedience, any sermons on obedience easily fall into the most boring sermon category and nobody wants to watch them. But any sermon that talks about blessings or how to get blessings, everybody on the internet wants to watch them. But you notice what some of those preachers leave out? The obedience condition for those blessings. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, we can preach about the last part. Nobody wants to hear about the first part. If you want to be a, if you want to line yourself up to inherit those blessings in 2024 and see your dry bones problems turn into wet bones problems, problems full of flesh, full of muscle, full of life, full of energy, full of the breath of God, you need to develop a habit right now. I'm going to start obeying God no matter what, and I'm going to watch God turn my dry bones into a marching army of hope and progress. You got to decide what your theme for 2024 is. If 2023 didn't look good, you need to change your style. You need to make up your mind. I don't know how God's going to do this, but if God can make a dead army come to life, he can turn my dead bones into amazing opportunities. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know if he's going to ask me to do something crazy, but as long as I know it's from God, I know that even dead, dry bones can live. Whose eyes are you looking at 2024 through? Because if you're looking at it through the same eyes that only see sadness and depression and hopelessness, you're looking through the wrong eyes. You need to look through the eyes of him who can do abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Because he's the one who can say to Lazarus, come forth. And a man dead four days can come forth alive. You need to put it in the hands of somebody who can walk on the waters of impossibility right into the heart of your rocking, sinking boat and say, peace, be still. The disciples saw a ghost. They thought death was coming, but life was coming the opportunity to set them free was coming. I don't know what you went through in 2023. I went through some stuff. And trust me, I'm preaching to myself. I am preaching to myself. We all want that instant miracle. But God ain't stupid. I've seen people, fake paperwork to get blessings. And as soon as they get what they want, they cancel the paperwork. They think God's stupid. Some people will pretend to obey for a week or two, hoping that they can trick God into a blessing. Then they go right back to what they were doing. God is not stupid. The Bible says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is open and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He sees your thoughts. He sees your actions. He sees your deeds. When be obedience gets to the very core of your being, and it becomes a definition of your lifestyle such that the people around you who love to compromise can't stand you anymore because you always insisted on doing the right thing. You're getting close to a habit of obedience. And when you get to that habit, God's going to test you. He's going to take you from level to level. And you'll be amazed what God will do. I can't tell you when he's going to do it. But he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. You may not, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Now, if we had the time to read the rest of this chapter, we might have to pick this up and pick up the rest of this, do part two of this sermon tonight at uh, watch night service because there's, there's so much more here to learn. But if we keep reading, we'll realize that these promises were given to 
Israel, God's chosen people. How do we as Gentiles become part of God's chosen people? You got to repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ and become born again a child of God with full rights, full birth rights to the kingdom of God. So if you not sure how 2024 is going to go. Or you want to go into 2024 with God at your back, in your front, and in you, indwelling by the Holy Spirit. Here's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sins and give your life to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, this is what you must do. It says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe. You can't just talk the talk. you got to walk the walk. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Is there anyone here today who wants to give your life to Jesus? Just raise your hand where you are. Anybody? 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 Let's all say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, today, I choose to repent of my sins. Dear Jesus, today I ask you to come into my heart as Lord and Savior. Wash me clean of my sins and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've given your life to Jesus, make sure to come and see me afterwards. I want to pray with you. I want to give you some materials to get you on this journey. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I turn you over now to, I think we have announcements. Any